Hello, everyone. Welcome again to ModX Network Voices. In this uh, issue, uh, we're going to be interviewing an academic and also practitioner architect, uh, Kyle Mo. Uh, Kyle is in Montreal and uh, uh, has been an academic for quite a few years. He's going to introduce himself. Before we get started, I'm Ryan Smith, as usual, and my partner, Ivan Rupnik. Ivan, like to say hello. Hi, Ryan. Hi, Kyle. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Kyle Mo. Uh, Kyle, why don't you introduce yourself to us and then we'll get into some uh, some discussion about what you've been working on lately. Great. Uh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, so I'm a practicing architect. Uh, I've been practicing since I was 17 years old, um, currently practicing in the Northeast and, and doing research uh, primarily in Canada at the moment through my appointment as the Gerald Sheff Professor of Architecture at McGill University. Uh, a lot of that research is focused on the timber building um, and a whole set of whole set of uh, issues related to that uh, in the architecture and construction uh, contexts. Great, Kyle. Uh, maybe you can dive into some 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 burning questions that you know Ryan and I have about your work. Um, as you know, ModX is focused on offsite construction, um, and your work is it has some very interesting overlaps. And I wanted to discuss a little bit um, some of the conceptual framework around one of your more recent uh, 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 academic projects, uh, Wood Urbanism, from the molecular to the territorial. Um, can you talk a little bit about that project and, and the, particularly the interscalar nature within which you decided to look at wood, wood building, wood construction, um, and why did you choose that lens and um, how has that served you as, a, as an academic but also as a practitioner? Yeah, so um, as a researcher, teacher, and, and you know, architect, uh, one thing I like about wood is that it really forces some questions that go beyond how we were trained as kind of modern architects. Uh, modern architecture, we were, design, we were taught to kind of design these beautiful objects, and then we just kind of specify how they're built with certain materials and systems, that sort of thing. Uh, no longer think that that's adequate, and this is one way that my research, I think, does relate well to the off-site uh, domain, is that um, I think everybody in the off-site world knows that they're designing an object, but they're moreover, they're designing some larger process, whether it's what's going on in the factory, uh, but I hope um, also what's going on in the supply chain and, and all the kind of ecological and social and political uh, questions that emerge once you really start to map out that everything that's included in construction. So um, it's, I think it's less um, easy to abstract, you know, the kind of terrestrial inputs into a building uh, when you're dealing with wood. It's like you see the piece of wood, you see a wood column, you, to some degree you can kind of imagine the tree that it came from and the forest that it came from, hopefully. Etc. But when you're looking at a you know a concrete beam or a concrete column, it's kind of hard to imagine where all that stuff came from. Um, mm -hmm. So I think for architects uh, and builders, um, there's a way in which the kind of you know kind of timber is a more intuitive sort of uh, system uh, in that sense, in that kind of transscalar sense. So I worked on the wood urbanism book with a couple of colleagues when I was uh, teaching and researching at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, Jane Hutton and, and Daniel Abanez. Um, and the, the simple thing, you know, the simple task of that book, which ends up being about 450 pages, is just to sort of uh, kind of explicate or kind of draw out all the different scales and connections that are associated with timber building. Uh, so there's the timber buildings themselves, but you have to go into all the kind of forestry questions uh, into, you know, post and, you know, after what happens to wood buildings after the fact, uh, et cetera. So uh, we take a kind of transscalar nexus based approach uh, to hopefully just kind of redescribe and characterize what timber building actually is. Um, so throughout the book, we have, you know, chapters on carbon, we have chapters on ecology and forestry, et cetera. Uh, there's six chapters um, and within that they all have these kind of case studies and, and expert uh, articles and that sort of thing to help you know explain more comprehensively what timber building is and I think that again does relate to the um, off-site industry in the sense that I think it's 
Uh, it's a group of designers who do understand how to design multiple scales at once, how to design the whole system. And uh, I think even that though can be expanded uh, in its important ways. Um, so we'll probably get into that later in, the, in our discussion uh, on this podcast. Kyle, um, I've always been fascinated with your work because it layers on what you might call in the sciences um, uh, systems thinking or a systems-based approach where you create boundary conditions and you look at flows and you're trying to understand the problem from a, a set of parameters. Um, I think that's really fascinating, especially for a design and construction industry, which historically has not thought that way, right? It's been a very much a linear process uh, to deliver a project um, and then go on to the next project. Could you talk about the why? Uh, over time, this word, Wood Urbanism book and your research more broadly, why do you do this research? Is it awareness? Is it trying to change the industry and architects thinking? Um, is it trying to preserve and manage the planet's resources? Um, uh, you know, what is the, what's the motivation? If you could talk a little bit about that and, and where do you think that comes from in your story in your background and in your, um, your development? Try, sorry, sorry to get existential, but I, I wonder yeah. where this all comes from and, and what motivates you. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, it's a great question. And, you know, I think for me, it's a 25 year long question of just simply trying to understand uh, what building is actually, uh, what's all involved with it. And, some related questions of why do we build the way we do? Why do we, why do we have you know 16 layers in our wall assemblies and uh, et cetera, et cetera? These are all just questions that I don't think have any real good answers, even though everybody will tell you that that's the way we do things, and yet very few people can actually explain why. So there's some kind of interesting historical content to that. There's some ecological content to it, et cetera. Um, I'm absolutely convinced the way that we've thought of buildings as objects in the linear way that you described is directly responsible for our contributions to climate change and uh, social, racial injustices, et cetera, that we've just been, we have tons of blind spots in architecture and in the construction industry. Um, so the, the kind of first, the starting point for me was systems boundaries, both a kind of ecological question it's also a political question because once you start to map out mm -hmm. what the full construction ecology of building actually is, then you're also starting to map out all of the kind of pol political and social and economic connections and who's benefiting from a particular system design over another, et cetera. So there's a lot at stake. I think there's ethical questions, um, both about you know the people involved in the systems and there's ethical questions about the non-human entities in the system. You know, can we? continue to make uh, the future colony of the president uh, through design like we've been doing and like we've been trained to do for, for decades. Um, I don't think we can. So the work with kind of using, you know, a systems-based approach to map out the entire ecology of construction is just a way to get beyond some of the most entrained habits that we have, whether they're design or thinking about construction or the false divide between those two, et cetera. Um, so I don't know, there, there's a lot of, um, it's a very deep question for me that you asked, Ryan, and one that's mm -hmm. we could spend a lot of time on. Um, but I just mm -hmm. need to blast through some of the kind of most, you know, uh, the kind of most obdurate assumptions that we have in architecture and construction about what building is. Um, and it, it, it takes a long time to do that, but I think it's starting to really cohere into a kind of, um, serious method and a way of, of describing the, what what building is to ourselves in a new way. Great, and I, th I think one, um, just to follow up on, on Ryan's point, you know, it, I also, I know that, one, you know, one of your big motivations and the comment you made early on is that, you know, you, you're a researcher, but you're also very much a practitioner and a designer and you use your, you use buildings as kind of testing these ideas. Um, and one concept that was maybe it might be useful for the audience and was always useful for me was in an early one of your earlier articles you, know, you talked about the stick and the stack uh, as a as a kind of really way of understanding the difference between mass timber construction and conventional wood construction um, and that was also a way of understanding using this tra tra uh, this in transcalar lens maybe can you maybe you can talk about that like in some of your work how has 
this lens played it played itself out in some of your own projects and how is it how have you been able to instrumentalize it in very you know um, everyday uh, kind of professional ways as well yeah so we were you know I think most architects and builders are trained to think in terms of, of sticks uh, stick construction so lumber and plywood and that sort of thing on-site construction you know very kind of traditional approach um, I still do a lot of work on sites because I'm building in, in very rural locations where transportation is often very difficult. So um, I tend to use uh, a solid wood form of construction, but not CLT, but kind of like a set like stacked cinders or other sort of laminated processes, kind of like hard, uh, dry laminated uh, solid wood uh, techniques uh, for my projects. Um, but once you really dive into the construction ecology of each of those, it's it's incredibly different. Uh, both what's going on, maybe like how and where the wood is is harvested. Uh, usually with stick construction, that's pretty hard to trace that back out. Um, but when I'm ordering, you know, pretty peculiar profiles of solid wood timbers, I usually know who's milling it, where they're getting their materials from, et cetera. And I think that that's a uh, in the end, an important fact about some of those projects. Uh, but there's other things going on with the solid wood construction, but there's a lot of, um, you know, thermal properties that we don't exploit in buildings that I think we should. Um, a solid wood building should have a completely different building code and energy code than a concrete building or even a stick frame building. Yeah. There's just such different thermal properties. Once you get up to, you know, a, like a few inches of solid wood, that uh, there's a you know, radical difference in terms of performance. Um, there's also, of course, a radical difference in terms of the carbon cycles of, of these different approaches. So like the stick approach, you have a quite randomly sourced uh, set of arbitrary materials. And every time you encounter some problem in the design process, you just add another layer of petroleum to block out air or vapor or moisture or whatever it might be, weather. Um, but with the solid wood approach, everything gets sort of uh, sized uh, into this one layer. So it's the structure, it's the finished material, it's everything. So um, it's a kind of eco like a very general ecological principle is making single things have multiple functions rather than having every like many things doing a single function. So it's about actual genuine complexity rather than the complicatedness of a kind of a stick stick approach to construction. Um, Almost like a legibility in a way, it seems like uh, that it, there's a clarity or a quote unquote dumbness to the to the solid timber approach. It allows yeah, you there is there is a kind of apparent dumbness to the solid approach. Um, but what I like about it is that it it's when you when six inches of wood has to do everything, then I get to know every lot about everything right. it needs to do. Whereas like we actually, you know, it's impossible again to kind of trace back out the construction ecology of all these uh, petroleum layers and, and whatnot and, and buildings all the kind of petroleum that we convert into you know insulation and stuff like that it's just a, it's a very uh, bizarre terrestrial thing that we're doing um, but with the solid construction you can actually start to know and understand uh, what, what this one material is and everything that it's doing in a kind of transcalar sort of way um, you know I, I, yeah, let's yeah, continue. Yeah. Something that's been really interesting to me, maybe you could comment on this, is there seems to be, um, not just seems to be, I think there is, a strong interest from architects currently, um, as well as the construction industry at large, but architects and students, uh, visionaries, um, creative minds in wood currently, in wood building. And uh, so it, it sort of captured the imagination um, and both, uh, both from an environmental performance perspective and an aesthetic, let's be honest, an aesthetic perspective, right? And so it's a really unique time in that, you know, uh, in the history of, of buildings where um, those two things have converged. Something that may be really good for the planet may also be really good aesthetically and uh, may be able to find quite quite a, uh, some legs. Uh, um, could you talk a little bit about what you see going on? And, um, yeah, and, and then I'd like to do a follow-up question to that about uh, um, people who are currently fighting this as well uh, on the other side. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. 
Um, so yeah, I am interested in the fact that um, wood has the capacity, let's say, to have both like aesthetic uh, virtue, um, but it also has um, or look, it has both aesthetic virtuosity and virtue, right? It can be a, in a conventional terms, a, con a beautiful building. Uh, but in my world, there's also, it's the only material that I know of that could also have a beautiful sort of system or ecology attached to it, right? Because uh, I don't think it's possible anymore to do like a beautiful glass, concrete and steel building and call it beautiful. Because I, I, I just yeah. fundamentally find it to be vulgar what it's doing to the planet um, and, and how architects design it is, is vulgar to me. Um, so wood is the only material that has that potential for virtue and virtuosity. Um, but that doesn't mean that people who are doing wood buildings now are doing virtuous buildings. I don't think that's the right. case at all. I think there's there's a lot of highly irresponsible discussion about carbon and carbon sequestration and in, in architects using timber. Um, and I, I just there's no evidence for this whatsoever. Uh, it is true that as a tree grows, it is locking carbon into its its structure. That's what the cellulose uh, biomass is. Um, but this, it's just like the, it's a real problem of, of thought to think that that tree has a certain amount of carbon locked into it because the tree is actually just a subcomponent of the forest. Um, and so if you're not designing the forest, then there's no hope that your building's going to be carbon neutral or whatever. Uh, so just get, throw some numbers at that, you know, Canada, um, I think it's what, 42% uh, forested. Um, like the landmass of Canada is all forested, uh, which is you know pretty amazing for a country, um, and you know has very few people relative to that number of trees. Uh, but even in Canada, the, the forests in Canada are a source, a source of carbon emissions, not a, the kind of sink of carbon emissions, and that's just an absolute fact. Natural Resources Canada has that very well documented. Uh, over they've been tracking this for you know decades. Um, and so there's no way in which like a wood, like a tree or a column or a CLT panel pulled out of, a, you know, a, a source of carbon emissions is ever going to be, you know, you're, you're just going to keep adding sources of carbon emissions by driving it around, harvesting it, you know, uh, processing it, et cetera. Um, so in Canada, there's no way that a, a CLT panel is like carbon neutral or has sequestered carbon in it. Um, it's a just, a, again, it's a system boundary problem. People like are just extracting the tree, not trying to understand the whole forest. So the task in Canada um, and, and probably the US, but the US doesn't even have the data to even get started on kind of articulating the research question or design question properly. Uh, but the question is like, how do you design and synchronize timber building with forest building? So how do you extract forestry cycles and dynamics and which species are you extracting, where are, are they being extracted and what's the kind of resultant wood components that you get out of that because it's different. You know, a CLT panel is different because, I mean, we make CLT panels out of black spruce because they're basically mono species in Quebec. Um, but if you're in New England, you have a very different mix of species and you should definitely not be making CLT panels in the northeast of the United States. You should be making other smaller components like glue lambs or other, you know, kind of smaller panel products out of a mixed species, which can get very interesting. Um, so that's a, you know, it's a fairly long-winded uh, response, but um, there's, there's, you know, everybody's throwing their arms around about a carbon sequestration, but uh, I just, I just don't even see how it's possible uh, once you really start to consider it from an ecological perspective. But it's the only material that we could, so it's the only one we should be focusing on, and we should all be going in on that. But uh, we have to stop, you know, greenwashing all these materials with with these carbon numbers and, and get serious about um, the carbon cycles of timber buildings, because I think it, it can be interesting, and it's going to make the architecture better, um, not worse, by investing in uh, thinking about forest building and timber building at the same time. Yeah, yeah. This is not necessarily new i mean this kind of thinking seemingly is uh, uh we see in, in more so in central europe but a lot in scandinavia um you know the, ivan and i did an interview with uh, uh with helena lidlow limbax and we did this sweden webinar on mod x and in it there was a strong they have a swedish wood building council and it's that council is under 
um, the wood council in general in Sweden. And so there, that, you know, what's become synonymous in Sweden fascinatingly is um, uh, forestry, for, uh, sustainable forestry practices, wood building, land management and in now, general. Yeah. Land management in general, and now pre and now prefabrication. So that that whole connection is an or you see the organizational connections now and the structural connections happening in society, and of course the economic connections. But that followed seemingly on a like, like you're saying a uh, a supply chain and uh, and hopefully a sustainable supply chain. So they're trying to continuously improve that. Um, do you see, and I know you spent time in Finland because you were there at, uh, uh, in the wood program in Finland at uh, Alto University, is that correct? Oh. Right, yeah. I mean, what, what yeah. do you see North America being able to, um, you know, are they starting to pick up on what's happened in Scandinavia? And, you know, Scandinavia has a lot, a lot uh, more to do, obviously, but uh, what do you see as the current practice in Scandinavia, in Finland? Uh, what you know what where do they have to go and then what is north america's next steps to get at the um the approach you're talking about would you say yeah i mean it's you know i forget uh i forget if i think finland's about the size of connecticut or something in terms of land mass or like it's a pretty small thing so it's mm -hmm. um like you know your state more or less like you have a sense of what's going on in that so it's it's easier i think in scandinavia to have a sense of what's going on in North America, it's just such a large geography that it's very easy to yeah. have these kind of uh, literal and conceptual rifts in the building industry. Because uh, you don't, you know, like where that sheet of plywood comes from, it's just impossible to know. But in Finland, it's a little bit more intuitive. People grow up with the forest. Uh, they know it's a huge part of the national history. Same in Sweden. Um, like even like you know, the, the reason why they're moderately successful in the 20th century is from from forestry and it's a bigger part of the culture in general i'd say yeah. um yeah. people are paid better the conditions are better etc you know it's like it's just a bigger it's more important to them nationally um so i, I think it, they're always going to be further ahead um and um they're also much more aware of the certain certain limitations of the amount of area that they have so they have to they do have to manage their forest mm -hmm. in a different way um in ways that are evolving and you know uh and starting to understand forests as complex systems rather than as civil culture practices, I think is a, mm -hmm. a huge thing that is starting to happen in, in uh, Quebec and in, in West uh, British Columbia. But I just, there, it's not really happening in the US yet. It's still a kind of extraction uh, context um, and uh, you know, big industry context. And there's less about kind of small scale forestry and uh, kind of more nuanced practices. So I think it'll take a while for the U.S. to mature uh, to some of those more sophisticated understandings of, of forest building and timber building, but um, it, it could start to happen. Um, and again, I think I do think the um, off-site construction could start to drive that. If, if those if questions about harvesting and, and what, what forestry practices are, are part of the kind of scope and purview of, of an off-site uh, construction company, uh, then I think that that would have a, a pretty big impact. I think it would be a pretty big shift. Um, and I think there are some, you know, minor examples of that, like like in uh, uh, Eastern Washington State, up by you, Ryan. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some, you know, there's some good examples. There's some good small examples in Quebec um, that are emerging. So it's it's we can start to see it in North America. Yeah. And it seems it yeah. seems consistent yeah, I think that's, it, with. I was going to say, I just, but I'm not going to ask questions. This is comment, and then Ivan, please go. Um, I, I just, it seems consistent, as you're saying, Kyle, with the offsite construction industry and, and being able to, as a manufacturer, and being uh, data driven, right? So you, you collect a lot more data, you analyze a lot more data as a manufacturer, as all manufacturers do, instead of uh, uh, as a builder, which there's not a lot of motivation to collect that data because you're not trying to increase productivity levels or other. Other things. So, if I'm collecting data on labor and productivity and supply chain, um, by extension, taking another step to try to understand the forest and uh, civil culture practices, um, seemingly is closer than than our site built process, right? And so, I, I think we can get there easier if we rely on that. Ivan, go right ahead. 
No, no, just again, building on what you guys are saying um, and also the example of Sweden and Finland, uh, but also what we've seen in the US. I mean, I guess for, for Kyle, because of back to the, or to the wood urbanism theme too, is like, what, what scale do you think, you know, honestly, where do we start in the US? Because, uh, you, you know, in, in Canada, it's, it's also provincial, right? So Quebec and maybe BC have something going on at, at Canada, at the scale of Canada, maybe not so much, even though this, the country has, as a whole different management management strategies. Um, versus somewhere like Sweden, where like in the mid '90s, you know, we, we've been looking into this. Like, there was a decision really by the private sector, by the forestry sector, really for economic reasons, to say we're going to change, we're going to value up the, the timber building proposition, and construction is a big part of it. And it was, it somehow aligned the cultural, the in some ways the ecological. Though I, I think I agree with you that you know we need to be skeptical of that, but. Um, the, the industry aligned with certain interests and they invested some money and they changed policy and all of a sudden they went from single family being the only way that timber was being used to much to 15% market share. Like, in, do you, you, you've looked at Maine, you've looked at Quebec, what's the right, do you have a sense of what the right scale for even political change on a very practical level would be? Or is it, where, do, where do we start? Um, again, that's going to be harder in the U.S. just because it is so much bigger as an entity and the, the kind of voices are, you know, I guess the respective voices of different territories in the U.S. are so different. And, uh, and Sweden has a kind of inherent, you know, similar geography, more or less, like a shared geography. So it's easier to, uh, to get consensus on that. But for something, you know, driven by the industry, I just think it would just be amazing both as a kind of conceptual thing, but also as a very practical entrepreneurial sort of thing for a, a, a fairly large scale offsite entity to also become a forestry business as well. Just like simply adding that in the way that same way that Henry Ford was going to, you know, to the Amazon to get rubber. He just wanted to kind of like integrate, you know, the whole supply chain and have um, quote unquote control over it. But it was also just, I mean, it was just to, design it and to you know hopefully extract some efficiencies i would like to think for some you know uh, good uh in the kind of more public and common sense um but i just think that that's one way that things will start to change is because uh right now these these industries like the forestry industry and the building industry don't really talk together that much there's just a kind of uh, handshake over kind of you know logging trucks um but I, there's there's a lot more to be had there, and I, 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 my sense, my hunch is that there's also like a pretty great business opportunity there that I think is has important economic benefits for a range of uh, constituencies, but also it's the only way we're going to get to some of the ecological benefits um, that I think I hope are also motivating uh, that kind of proposition. It seems like the cost, I mean, that's the, it's funny that you said, you know, like, like a offsite company getting involved with land management or forestry, because what we've seen, like, and again, in Sweden, it was forestry companies that got involved with offsite because they knew the, they were looking for increased value in their product. And they also had a kind of a land management culture and a manufacturing culture already. So by the sixties, they were driving change. Um, and so in the, in, whereas in the US, we, uh, I think there's another problem, maybe you talk about it too, is that wood so globally wood construction is two percent it's very low it's actually it's, a, it's still a radical proposition i think we take it for granted in the us but in around the world it's very even sweden had a fairly low market share until fairly recently um but so like do you think there's a do you think the the, the fact that we're from we're is it a problem that we're familiar with the stick is that what's keeping what what's keep what's the cultural barrier to uh to wood changing in the us because again in every like in european union they're trying to increase wood uh, uptake, and it's actually very hard. Like people have cultural biases towards wood construction, fire, uh, insects, whatever. Those things have all been solved, but but we have some other kinds of cultural barriers, and yet we have we have wood construction in the U.S. and in Canada, and yet it's, it hasn't changed uh, in 150 years. Uh, and it's the stick, you know, it's it's it is it's an ecological material, but in, in a, a not an ecological process. Like so, how how do you see that cultural change happening? Yeah, it's tricky because I, I think in the U.S. a lot of its momentum, its kind of technological momentum, is attached to the fact that it's just such an easy entry point. Like any guy who can buy a skill saw and a truck can basically start building houses in the U.S. and it, it works, you know. And you can develop that up into a pretty significant business, as you know, millions of people have done. Um, so I think that's just such an easy 
model, but that's that's I think that's a pretty big driver of it. It's like a you know just it's a it's a great in that sense. Um, uh, the things we're talking about require a whole different level of capital investment and kind of you know business planning and organizational thinking. Um, you know even more science and like, you know design. Uh, which is incredibly interesting, but really rare in the U.S. that 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 mm -hmm. some CEO has that kind of vision to to pull all of that together. So, I think it's just the the sheer you know kind of divergent uh, types of momentum. You know, the kind of bottom up easy form of you know, a guy with a pickup truck versus a much larger you know something that's going to have to come out of Silicon Valley or something like that in terms of investment uh, to think through all those scales in a kind of single way, at least in the uh, United States. Canada, it's slightly different because I think there's there's closer relationships between kind of forestry, building, you know, industry, the government, et cetera. There's a lot more research support, uh, business support, uh, people just talk to each other more there. So I think it, it could happen in Canada probably faster than it could in the US. I liked what you said though, Kyle, about like in Eastern Washington, the model of Vaughan Timbers is pretty fascinating. You know, family who has a, a forestry practice and its history and partners with uh, the forest land owners, has a sawmill and now has become a mass timber uh, supplier. That's a model we've seen in Europe and uh, could play fairly well in the United States and Canada if, uh, if implemented properly. So there's not only the Silicon Valley investment, but there's also the sort of small regional um, wood manufacturer, right? That 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 uh, can build up capacity. Okay. It, you know, I want to try to finish this conversation out by talking about education, if we could, a little bit. We've talked a lot about the industry and supply chain uh, practices and um, approaches, uh, thought processes that need to change. How about in education, the education of architects, engineers, and contractors, construction managers? currently sort of an outmoded model. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you think needs to change in the educational model, whether that's at the specific curriculum level or sort of a macro level uh, readjustment of higher ed to, uh, to get to, to, to what you're talking about? Yeah, well, I think in like a, in a good, but maybe for some terrifying sort of way, uh, universities are just crashing right now. Um, I think that whole model is 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 you know on its last legs, and uh, you know it's it's increasingly expensive and increasingly underperforming as a as a product. Um, and so um, I'm kind of excited to think about what what the next possible iterations might be. I love thinking about some you know some school of of building or maybe timber timber building that's probably a little bit more guild-like. It's probably got a lot of uh, kind of work study attached to it. Um, you know, deep practical and deep theoretical training is, is possible in that kind of context. So I think in the kind of, you know, as, as these schools continue to crash for all kinds of reasons, especially schools of architecture, which have been just, just completely irresponsible and inglorious in their, their, their pursuits, um, I think there will be some interesting things that emerge, and I hope they do come out of industry uh, to some degree. I hope they're pushed by, you know, big you know, offsite companies as much as anything else. Um, I think it's it's time for that because uh, we need to be thinking about real things with real data, with people who are motivated by you know uh, actual things in the world. Um, whereas I think most academics are in universities because they want to avoid interacting with the world. Uh, and that's that's characterized education for decades now. So I think there are some uh, some big transformations coming. But on a kind of more basic level, again, what I like about timber building as now as speaking as a teacher is again, it just it's very easy for me to you know ask a student where the bean comes from and have them map that out and start doing some ecological analysis of that and start to talk about what's going to happen to that. Is it going to be disassembled or reused or repurposed in some way or et cetera. So start thinking about kind of other temporal scales of, of building as well uh, and the kind of cycles involved. Um, so timber is a great way to crack open a lot of the kind of dormant assumptions about, again, what building is. So um, it's 
you know, the timber building is incredibly useful, and I think offsite construction is also, I can say the same thing, incredibly useful as a kind of pedagogical tool to help think through and ask questions about you know, that for, for students. Um, and uh, I, yeah, um, but uh, if you, anybody who wants to uh, get in on some alternative education model, just please get in touch with me. I think uh, it's time, we're long overdue for some alternative to uh, these overpriced and uh, failures of uh, schools of architecture. Well, I uh, want to thank Kyle Moe again for coming and participating. Thank Ivan for joining me as well. Um, and this is another episode of ModX Voices. We hope to get you next time. Please look at the, uh, the links on the YouTube clip. We'll have some more information about Kyle's work. Uh, you can look at uh, some things that he's been teaching and also some of the research and scholarly work he's uh, produced to extend some of this thinking. Thanks again, Kyle. Appreciate your time. Thanks, guys. Talk to you soon.